This is really driven by uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren and the Biden administration, you know, putting political pressure on um, the the administration to find a way to to limit or uh, eliminate Bitcoin mining in the U.S. And th those are their words, not mine. This content is brought to you by Uphold, which is a great crypto platform that I've been using since 2018. Uphold has all the top cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and all the altcoins. In fact, they have 260 plus cryptocurrencies on their platform. You can also trade precious metals, stable coins, and 37 fiat currencies. In addition, they are available in over 150 countries. And this platform is fully reserved. They do audits. So you can trust that your funds are safe. No commingling, no lending out your funds. If you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description. Welcome to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Lee Bratcher, who's the president of the Texas Blockchain Council. Lee, it's great to have you on. Tony, yeah, I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, Lee, there's lots to talk about uh, as it relates to Bitcoin mining, the Department of Energy, and much more. But before we get there, tell us about yourself. You know, where are you from and uh, what's your professional background? Yeah, I um, was a political science professor before I started the Texas Blockchain Council in 2019. My research area was property rights and then property rights and blockchain. So real, when I realized that you could have digital scarcity and that that digital scarcity could be applied to real world assets, uh, I started to write academic papers on the topic. And uh, from there, began to liaise with different crypto and blockchain companies and elected officials and um, realized that there was a gap in the market for a trade association that could do that that kind of work. And so that's when I started the TBC. Mm. And what was your first encounter with Bitcoin? I'm always curious about everyone's first encounter. Sometimes they hear it from friends, sometimes they saw it on a forum. And then what was the aha moment? You know, sometimes it takes a few t a few uh, encounters with it before it clicks. Right. Yeah, I was, uh, I'm sure I saw it uh, a few times on the, uh, you know, reading articles and stuff in 2013 and 2014, but I didn't take any action. Um, and then in 2015, maybe early 2016, I was at the Army War College. Uh, I'm an Army Reserve officer as well. So at the Army War Co College doing some research uh, on my civilian research related to property rights. And that's when I read the um, the Bitcoin white paper and and really thought, you know what, this is going to be not only the focus of my research, but I'm going to try to make a career out of this. Hmm. Uh, th this is going to change the world. So tell us about the Texas Blockchain Council and what's the mission and, and some of the things you guys are doing. We're not, we're a 501c6 trade association. So like a chamber of commerce, we work on policy and advocacy related uh, matters. And we also work as a business development amplifier for our about 95 member companies. Mm -hmm. And are you given a name just specific to Texas? Are there plans to go to other states and expand this type of uh, work? Well, we typically work on state level policy here uh, in Austin, the capital of Texas, and we also do some DC uh, work alongside partners up there. Mm -hmm. um, but no plans for the TBC to exp expand to other states. There are a few, uh, actually a number of other state associations uh, across the country, about 40. And I serve as the chair of the board for the U.S. Blockchain Coalition, which is really just a federation, a loose federation of all those state associations. And we share best practices and work together. Mm. Now, Bitcoin mining has been booming in the United States, but largely in Texas. And I've spoken to some of the miners and there's been, you know, really great job creation, economic growth locally. Um What's the latest there? You know, uh, have how have things grown maybe within the past year or so? Yeah, depending on which data set you look at, um, if you're looking at publicly traded miners, where more than forty percent of U.S. hash rate is is in Texas, and um, if you even look at kind of estimates for usage and and consumption and hash rate, 
we're actually close to 50% here in, in Texas. So we're proud of that. Um, Texas is uh, an interesting you know, location because of uh, the energy only marketplace that ERCOT uh, runs. And it essentially allows miners to find gaps and places where uh, power is underutilized or stranded. Mm. And if it's underutilized or stranded, it's typically cheaper. And so uh, it's just a lot of market signals and price signals for miners to find cheap power here. And uh, there was just some data released uh, a few days ago from ERCOT that showed just how well the miners are doing curtailing their power consumption so that they're not adding to peak demand. Uh, it doesn't really matter how much uh, power you consume if you don't add to peak demand because sure. our our grid consumption patterns are all over the map. And you know if you can use all that power in the uh, in the low demand times, that's actually healthy for grid stabilization. It's healthy for grid, uh, for energy generators, whether that's wind, solar, natural gas, doesn't matter, right? Um, they all need power buyers at mm -hmm. times of low demand, like overnight. So we're, yeah, that, yeah, I, we're I excited for that symbio that. symbiotic relationship. Mm. Yeah. And I've heard about, um, you know, these miners helping to make keep the grid more sustainable, if that's the right word, uh, where, you know, mining, like you say, mining at certain times, uh, turning off where needed. Um, so things have gotten much more uh, fine-tuned and uh, working a well-oiled machine, essentially, but, you know, like you said, symbiotic between the miners and, and the power grid. So that's really great to hear. Now, unfortunately, there's some energy FUD making the rounds again. <laughs> I feel like it's you know, 2017 all over again. Um, it's coming out of the White House, and and maybe this is the larger theme of the pushback on Bitcoin and the entire crypto industry, because they they don't understand it, or there are incumbents who are getting disrupted or pushing back. You know, what are your thoughts on on this latest round of energy fud? Yeah, this this is really driven by uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren and the Biden administration, you know, putting political pressure on. Um, the the administration to find a way to to limit or uh, eliminate Bitcoin mining in the U.S. and th those are their words, not mine. The limit or eliminate, uh, I believe that came from uh, the White House's science uh, Office of Science Technology Policies report. And we see the, the latest effort is to to rush through an emergency mandatory data collection um, from. Bitcoin miners, 82 different facilities across the country. Uh, and we won a restraining order against that uh, mandatory collection request last Friday in the Western District of Court, uh, Western District of Texas, the federal district court here. And um, th there's there's more uh, up in the pipeline for that, probably to be announced in the next. 24 to 48 hours, but uh, certainly working hard to make sure that um, we provide the government with data, but they don't, um, they're not able to require it in an unlawful way. And they're also not able to ask questions that are um, getting at data that's proprietary or sensitive. So certainly energy use data is totally fine. Um, data around what kind of machines you're using or what kind of contracts you've signed or who your energy partners are, corporate partners, that is unnecessary for the government to know. And all of those things were uh, attempted to be included in this survey and, and certainly unnecessary. You mean, Lee, the government has to abide by the laws as well? <laughs> Absolutely. And the, and the judge agreed. If you read the uh, the the TRO, it was quite um, instructive as to you know his concerns about the EIA's actions. Mm. Um, what are some of the other initiatives that you all are working on, if any? Um, I know things are ramping up as the market's heating up. Uh, the Bitcoin having is coming up. Is there anything else you want to highlight? Yeah, I, I think you know there are some important initiatives that you know transcend. The industry, right? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the ETF approvals were were big for all of us. Um, the 
I, I think sort of at a macro level, as we think about our engagement with uh, the U.S. government, we need to be uh, messaging uh, Bitcoin and the digital asset industry as a amplifier for U.S. national security interests, uh, as an amplifier to prolong the dollar as a world reserve currency. Of course, it would, it would help if they stopped printing so many and, you know, if they help, they, they calm down the quantitative easing a little bit. But, um, you know, stable coins are the, one of the largest buyers of U.S. treasuries. If, if stable coins were a country, they would buy, um, you know, fifth, they'd be the 15th largest buyer of U.S. treasuries. I've got to credit Nick Carter uh, for, uh, you know, mentioning that figure to me once. So uh, it's, it's really a, a, a macro approach that we need to take. And that is what our elected officials are concerned about. They're concerned about economic competitiveness and national security. And we need to show them how our industry affects that, not only here in the near term, but uh, in a much larger way five years from now. Yeah, absolutely. And and there are a couple bills in the House and there's a couple bills in the Senate. Um, Patrick McHenry, um, he's looking to push maybe the two bills uh, through the House this year. Um, you know, are you optimistic that uh, we could see comprehensive regulations maybe this year? I know it's an election year, so it's going to be wild, but uh, maybe in 2025. What are your thoughts on that? I'm optimistic about stablecoin legislation. Um, uh, not optimistic about the other, um, you know, bills that I, I think are good bills, to be sure. I applaud uh, Chairman McHenry, Senator Lummis, Senator Gillibrand, uh, all, all of the work that they have been doing for many years. Um, we just have such a divided Congress right now. And um, I think we'll have to get through the election to see how the dominoes fall and you know, see who's chairing what committees and things of that nature before we can really get um, the comprehensive bills passed. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree with you that stable coins are most likely to get through. I know the government overall is seems to be more concerned about stable coins because uh, you know, it's pegged to the dollar and can be used like the dollar. Um, so I'm sure the, tr the folks at the Treasury and so forth want to get a pulse on all of these things happening. And look, I, I understand their situation because you have a lot of stable coin issuers now. I mean, just recently PayPal launched theirs or, you know, late in 2023. So there could be a lot of stable coins out in the wild and there needs to be some sort of guardrails, but uh, it's the future. This is where things are headed, uh, tokenization and the digital economy. Um, with that said, you know, there's also CBDCs being worked on by governments. Um, you know, personally, I'm concerned about the alignment to the constitution and our right to privacy and so forth. But I do understand there's going to be tons of benefits in CBDCs. You know, what are your thoughts? It, it, obviously, a lot of these things are still in, in conversations. Yeah, we, we are concerned as well. And I think why, um, why invent something that is privacy encroaching and liberty, um, you know, destroying if you already have a private sector implementation of the U.S. dollar in in the form of a stable coin, so uh, I think stable coins are uh, far and away a, a better um, way to manage the problem that CBDCs would be solving, and so we are pretty strongly opposed to a central bank digital currency, and we support um, Senator Cruz's efforts to file legislation that would prohibit the federal government from uh, issuing a CBDC. It's pretty clear. I think the vast majority of people in the digital asset industry would probably agree. Uh, we need to look no further than China to see how a CBDC could be used. And, and it's also you know, something that I think we should rem remind ourselves is it's not that we don't trust the people in government. Currently, we may not trust, or maybe we don't, but we certainly don't know and probably shouldn't trust those institutions over the long term because uh, institutions typically, um, you know, they, they have a lot of benefits, but one of their downsides is they accumulate power. And if they have the power, they're going to use the power. So we need to keep our institutions healthy by limiting the power that they have. And, uh, you know, prohibiting a CBC is essentially 
uh, a non, you know, that, that's a, that's an easy win for our industry. It goes across really well politically as well. Democrats and Republicans are opposed. Um, you know, Republicans probably uh, slightly more so from the polling that I've seen, but um, both it's a, not, it's a bipartisan um, effort. So it's a win. We should take it. We should crush it and, um, you know, crush this, the idea of a CBDC and then move forward with innovating with stable coins. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Because like you said, stable coins can do pretty much everything that CBDCs can do. Just we don't have that privacy risk or the um, draconian manipulation of that, you know, and what they can do with it in the future. Like you said, maybe not now, but 20 years from now that happens. And then where where the where, where would the world be? Right. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see how things play out. Um, question for you as far as Texas as a state, and I don't know if you can answer this, but we're seeing talks of states and obviously countries are doing this, adding Bitcoin to their reserves. Um, and maybe this is a way to combat the fiat currency problem, right? You actually have a deflationary asset, a hard asset, um, that's truly hard, right? It, 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 it's capped. It's not like gold where you can continually mine. Um, is Texas looking to to add Bitcoin to their treasury? Uh, have, have there been talks and things along those lines? You know, I don't think so. Uh, at least there, I'm not aware of them. If there have been, I, I know we have had discussions with different uh, groups, including the Texas Bullion Depository, which was a legislatively created entity that allows Texans to um, hold gold here. And I, I believe also brought the Texas gold back from New York and, and custodies that here in Texas. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think that if, if Texas were to you know have Bitcoin on the treasury, it would need to be something in the form of of donated Bitcoin or uh, Bitcoin received from, um, you know, lost property, perhaps someone passes without a will or something like that or something like that. Um, so, you know, I don't think there's a real serious effort at that right now. But I, I think by the time the next legislative session rolls around, it will be included in those conversations because there was a question on this last, um, you know, when I voted a few days ago, or the primary, of course, Texas is one of the Super Tuesday states. So our, our official primary is March 5th, but I early voted. And I noted a question about um, gold and, um, you know, that's gold status um, as a monetary instrument here. And of course, you know, I think the elected officials and the state house will quickly come to realize that that Bitcoin is a just a better version of gold. It's the 21st century's version of gold. And um, of course, it can do so much more than that, as all of your listeners already know. But at least that's a good use case and a good conceptual framework for elected officials who may not be native to this industry. Uh, so and I'm even seeing on, on the clock behind you the as we've been speaking, the price of Bitcoin has gone up by like four yeah. percent just since we've started <laughs> this podcast. Uh, so that doesn't hurt when we're talking about getting the attention of elected officials. Mm -hmm. uh, so we we've thrown around different ideas, uh, like starting a trust, uh, like a Texas Bitcoin trust, and you know the benefactor of the trust could be the state of Texas. Um, you know that would be a small fry thing because it would be donated Bitcoin, right? And yeah. A few people would probably donate some Bitcoin, but not substantial amounts, right? So hmm. um, it'd be more more symbolic, and and the trust would then give the Bitcoin to the state of Texas, hmm. um, at which point the state is willing to custody it. Yeah, and look, I, I I still think we're relatively early. I mean, corporations are adding Bitcoin to their balance sheet. Obviously, MicroStrategy, Tesla, SpaceX. I think Reddit just recently they did the same. And I think that trend is going to continue, but you know the government's probably going to be a bit slower <laughs> for sure. But I, I think maybe ten years from now we could certainly see that local and um, federal and and uh, you know different countries doing the same. Um, how can folks support the Texas Blockchain Council? Uh, is can we donate and things along those lines? Yeah, you absolutely can. We are a C6 though, so um, we're, donations to us are not tax deductible. So what we encourage people to do um, is join the council. So we're a membership-based organization. 
uh, texasblockchaincouncil.org is where they can find more about us. Uh, and we have corporate and individual memberships where they can get involved uh, in policy. Um, you don't have to be from Texas to join. In fact, we have a lot of companies from around the country that join uh, because you know we're we're crafting policy here that matters across the country, and we also um, craft model policy that uh, uh, allies from other states uh, implement as well. Hmm. Um, question for you, and and once again, I know you guys are focused on Texas. Are you seeing any other states that are popping up that may rival Texas? You know, from a Bitcoin mining standpoint, um, and any uh, you know data or metrics that you can share there. You know, certainly not going to be possible for a state to rival Texas anytime soon. Just it's just the economics of it. Uh, but I would say, from a policy perspective, there's a lot of strong states out there that are. Uh, that have been working hard. Of course, Wyoming was one was kind of the OG of digital asset policy with Caitlin Long and and uh, a lot of her allies there. Um, there are you know Florida. I'm thinking North Carolina, Florida, Pennsylvania, uh, Washington, uh, Virginia, um, Ohio. I know I'm leaving out a few of our. our you know, there's a lot of sure. states that have just a really strong leaders in their various uh state associations and and we really enjoy getting to work with those guys and uh i think it takes all of us right we we is, is a critical mass at least it was not gonna take all 50 states you know we don't we, we don't necessarily need that but we need a critical mass of states and it helps to have some of the bigger states um as well so it's fun it's a fun process for sure um what do you think about you know the current cycle we're in, um, it looks like we're in another bull market cycle, obviously, as we're talking, the price is moving. Um, you know, what's your outlook um, given the ETFs and all the Wall Street is here and, and there's so much attention around Bitcoin now and, and new financial products being built? Um, are you anticipating new highs in 2025 and the four-year cycle playing out again? Yeah, I, I think I don't see any reason why you know, we would expect something different uh, from this cycle. Um, ETFs being here, I think, maybe kickstarted the bull market slightly earlier than in previous cycles. You know, typically it's post having, yeah. um, but that's not unusual, and there's pretty real and clear reasons for that. Uh, so, yeah, I'm I'm optimistic that we'll have an all time high probably next month. Um, maybe or maybe this week. <laughs> maybe today, if you and I just stay on this podcast, because <laughs> as we uh, as we see that tick up behind you, so yeah, yeah, it's it's crazy. I saw the stats this morning where the amount of Bitcoin being bought by the nine ETFs versus how much is being mined uh, per day. It's it's incredible. There is a, certainly a supply and demand shock here. It's it's amazing what's happening. Uh, so exciting times um, and. You know, one of the things I'm really looking forward to is uh, being able to spend some of my Bitcoin Satoshis, you know, when the value goes up and go to a local store or whatever it may be. I know some stores are act accepting it, but there's a lot of work being done with the Lightning Network. And I don't know if you've been keeping up with that and, and if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think we need some, we, we got to have better tax treatment for, for those kinds of things. You know, it would be nice if we could, um, like, have the de minimis tax exemption. Um, it, it would be great if there was another way to maybe, like, um, have, you know, capital gain, like, pr paid capital gains on at a certain amount, but keep it in Bitcoin. And, and from that point forward, then that would be de minimisly exempted when you purchase things at a store. Um there, there's just a lot of ways. I mean, we're not averse to paying taxes, but we don't want the tax implications to prevent right. ease of commerce, right? So um, th hopefully something like that will come. I don't think anytime soon. Now, I know that de minimis piece is part of the, at least the Senate, uh, you know, the Lummis Gillibrand bill. Uh, so hopefully we, we get some movement on that front. But um, yeah, I've got my lightning wallet and uh, I don't know what I use Moon, the Moon Wallet and Strike, of course, but I'm not sure what you use, Tony. If 
If you got strike. any recommendations for me? Yeah, I, I'm doing strike, but I haven't really used much of it because it's like uh same thing, like the tax implications and so forth. And I'm also waiting for Bitcoin to go up a bit higher where you know I, I can be more free with using Satoshis to to buy some things. Um but I know, look, there's a lot of folks who are building great technologies. I know um, uh, David Marcus, formerly from uh, Facebook and PayPal, uh, built, working on LightSpark, I believe it is. Yeah. So quite a few folks building technology. So yeah, I'm excited well, to see those come to fruition. Tony, here's a policy idea that I've just come up here in uh, our conversation about this. I mean, what what if there was a way to, to uh, take some of your Bitcoin and pay your capital gains, mm -hmm. right? And say, hey, I'm going to take 5% of my Bitcoin, pay capital gains on it, put it sep and, and separate it from the rest of my in a different wallet. Mm -hmm. And that Bitcoin is then uh, exempted from future gains or losses. Now, you, you, you can't write off the losses if it goes down, but you also so, so basically have the de minimis exemption, even though you didn't convert it to fiat. Right. Uh, probably a, t a host of issues there and a lot of. Uh, factors that, you know, external um, issues that we would need to, to figure out uh, to avoid, you know, the IRS privacy, probably, you know, there's a lot of concerns, but just some way to make this a little bit easier, I, I think would be helpful. Yeah, no, that's, I think that that's a great uh, base layer idea because like you said, we'll have to figure out the intricacies on top of it, but that makes sense. I would do that if I knew like, Hey, this amount uh, dedicated to capital gains and so forth, and I don't have to worry or calculate or think. I can just move freely. That would be interesting, and with the blockchain and uh, and different wallets and DAOs and so forth, it, I think that's possible. But it, it it's all goes goes back, like you said, to the IRS and how how you know we could work through the details with that. But uh, that's that's an interesting idea. Yeah. Um, all right, I got some wrap-up questions here for you. First, if you could create your own metaverse, what would the theme be? Huh. Um, the theme would probably be educational or civic. Civics, you know, I, I'm I'm a big believer in like getting people together and and civic engagement, sharing ideas, educating people, not indoctrinating people, certainly. That's the opposite of what I believe. Uh critical thinking and and being able to converse with people that have different views from from you and learning so i think that the theme would probably be civic engagement mm. and rapid fire questions favorite food pizza favorite musician or band oh uh, uh, i'm really into um morgan wallen right now mm. that's probably at my wife's doing she's a big <laughs> morgan wallen fan so like whenever i'm in the car there we're listening to morgan wallen uh favorite movie Braveheart. That's my favorite too. Uh, favorite book? A book called Mere Christianity, written by C.S. Lewis decades ago. Um, very uh, kind of apologetically minded book. Mm. And when you're not working at the Texas Blockchain Council, what are you doing for fun? Hanging out with the kids, you know, watching their soccer games, uh, playing pickleball, uh, that kind of thing. Nice. Lee, a great chat with you and I'm um, looking forward to future updates around the Texas Blockchain Council and folks go support the council. I appreciate all the great work you guys are doing. Thank you for joining me. Thanks, Tony. Have a great one.